Hello, I'm MSB and welcome to another episode of Pirates Two Wheel Treasures. This episode, I catch up with the co-founder of Colorado startup, Zyza, to get the skinny on their electrocycle that has recently launched on the crowdfunding platform WeFunder. The electrocycle looks like a cruiser from a science fiction film. The retro elements in the headlight, tank and the fantastic rear fender are akin to something from a 1950s episode of Buck Rogers or Flash Gordon. Zyza claimed this will be the world's first twin hub motorcycle with a 300 mile range, 120 mile an hour top speed, fast charging, advanced safety features and more. The startup wants the electrocycle to be the safest, most stylish and exciting motorcycle out there on the market. Joined here by Anthony Cross from uh, Zyzer Motorcycles. Um, so, Anthony, so the uh, the electrocycle is very different, very very different from other motorcycles, um, such as various Zero models and Harley Davidson's offering from their spin-off division, Livewire. Um, what was it about? the other electric bikes on the market that first sowed the seed in your mind for the electrocycle? Uh, you know, the, the way that Zyzer started, uh, it was about a year and a half ago, and we were, I was window shopping for a new electric bike and just found myself sort mm -hmm. of dissatisfied with what I was seeing um, and reached out to my now co-founder, Chris, and said, is there a way we can build this? Is there, you know, could we do all of the things that we want to do, at, you know, get higher range, bigger battery, et cetera, et cetera. And so we started talking and basically this came out of it. We're our main goal really though, truly. And what it's always been about is building a bike that we would like to ride, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think that's what sort of separates it out from a lot of other things is it, uh, other bikes that are out there is that it's a thing that we genuinely want to ride and feel like we could ride, you know? Sure. Excellent. So uh, tell us a little bit more about the Zyzer team. Um, I gather you've got somebody from uh, SpaceX Falcon rocket program on board. Yeah. Hunter is fantastic. He's a great guy. Uh, him and Chris met in the Penn state engineering program. So, um, you know, and Chris and I go way back. I mean, we've known each other for about 15 years now. We went to high school together. Okay. Uh, and so most of the, the team are comprised of people that we've come across in our various industries or school or, you know, whatever. Uh, and we've, we've sort of roped into this and who, feel the same way and are just as equally as passionate and talented, you know, uh, about getting this thing on the road. Cool. That sounds good. Um, so yeah, quite a, quite a team and, um, obviously a lot of commitment there as well. Um, now the spec on the electrocycle, you list, um, hub motors. So mm -hmm. that's quite challenging. Um, will these be match motors? I mean, tell us a little bit more about the, uh, the hub motors themselves. Uh, so we are currently in the process of developing our own, at this point, I would love to give you a little bit more spec, but I would I would say check back with me in a couple of months when we've ironed out some of this stuff completely. Mm -hmm. We have some ideas right now, and some of this stuff is just going to be that way. We have we have ideas of what we want, and we have our minimum threshold. We have our maximum threshold, but at this point, I think you know check back with me in a couple of months. But we're developing newer lightweight uh, motors, uh, lighter weight casings, uh, you know, water cooled. So there's there's a lot okay. to be that about that so it's going to it's going to have some bells and whistles for sure yeah it certainly sounds like it so um advanced safety features that, that's another thing that you list of on your specification to build into the bike um what will those features be tell me a little bit more of those so you know there are uh there's a couple of main ones i mean when we're talking about hub motors we have all-wheel drive there's some mm -hmm. you know uh, opportunity there for traction control and all these other lovely things that we've been working on but, you know, one of the key things is uh, interconnectivity is a big one for us. Um, and I have to say, you know, really quickly, some of these safety features have existed for a long time, right? Sure. Yeah, like yeah, uh, yeah. LIDAR sensors or, you know, uh, blind spot monitors, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Wiring them to handlebars with haptic feedback is a relatively new thing. Um, when we're talking about interconnectivity within, you know, like cellular connectivity, sure. the idea that there are hazards on the road ahead. I, I had a friend who um, was driving down a dark road um, just out in, in Texas not too long ago, mm -hmm. and there was a car on the road, slammed right into it and killed him. And the thing about it is, is that it's something that simple, if there was just a, a connectivity to Google that popped up a heads up display saying object on mm -hmm. road ahead 
or whatever it is, car with no lights on, whatever comes through. So yeah, proximity that, sensors, that, then, that, yeah. Well, and I don't know if proximity sensors would have saved them, but the connectivity through, you know, cellular, which is a relatively weak mm -hmm. that now, this is not science fiction, this is just, we, we can do it. Uh, yeah. That would have saved his life, there's no question. So, I mean, little things like this all on one bike, that's what's really going to make the difference as far as advanced safety features are concerned, do you know? Sure, most definitely. And I think, you know, we're also vulnerable on on motorcycles that, um, yeah, any any help that can be given in any way at all is um, a big, big, big bonus. Um, the wearable in connectivity as well. I mean, what's what's that about? So, you know, at the very least right now, I think um, one of the key things that we're looking at that seems to be the most developed are smartwatches, helmets. Those, mm -hmm. those are coming around very quickly. But we want to make sure that we have that tech sorted out so that when we do hit the road in late 2022 early 2023 we're not hopelessly behind do you know what i'm saying like sure. as, yeah. as this stuff is developing at a light speed rate we we have to basically be ready for and kind of you know ready for whatever is coming down the lane on that regard so it could it could be it could be beyond smart watches but it could also mainly just i think in the initial rounds are going to be uh helmets and things like that mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I guess um, sort of maybe a, a jacket would be nice as well. Uh... <laughs> there's come, come back to me in a couple of months again. There's some <laughs> developments we're working on with there's that. There's a little actually. bit of a disclosure there. You're not I mean, there, there <laughs> are some features that, you know, I really wish I could talk about that we've been kind of poking around in sure. over the last year and a half that we, we don't want to necessarily say it's going to be on the first bike because it may or may not be, but um, there's some really, really cool stuff in that area that's that's coming up very fast. Lots yeah, of and the, this tech is advancing so quickly that, um, yeah, I mean, to come up with a concept now that and secure to that concept within, by the time you actually get to production, it could be already outdated. So, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's actually, you know, uh, I'm sure we'll cover this, but that's actually one of our main concerns. And goals mm -hmm. is to not end up like that for sure. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the look and the feel of the bike really sort of clearly places it in the cruiser category. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's a distinct nod to the Arc Deco design, uh, but the wheelbase looks pretty long. Um, is there a practical for reason that, um, or is that purely for aesthetics? I, I will say I'm going to have to pay my rendering people overtime because uh, <laughs> I think a lot of people have arrived at the concept thinking that it's. 100% real. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just for the record, it, it's not. It's uh, we're raising money to build a production intended design. Um, I think with this, the wheelbase is going to probably change. Uh, the mm -hmm. rear fender is probably going to change certain aspects of it. I, I think the core style, if you were to sort of blur the image and take out, you know, as, as the, the, the core style of it, mm -hmm. we want to preserve that idea, this art deco and whatnot. But you know, now we've got to engineer it, we've got to build it, we've got to see what the pitfalls are that we missed. Things are just inevitably going to change. There's no way around it. So this is by no means like a completely finalized built, you know, design yet, you know. Of course, yeah. And so um, one of the other areas that um, the set of like mentioned that you might accommodate is uh, fully removable and replaceable batteries. Um, is the right to repair and sustainability a key driver in that? Or did other factors come into the decision? I, you know, I think uh, in our research and development time over the last year and a half, um, it, it really started off with sustainability. I mean, the idea of making a bike future proof, um, yeah. the idea that, you know, we can take these batteries out, we can take them and, you know, send them off to another company that does recycling, we can mm. upgrade your bike, keep your bike on the road for longer, et cetera, et cetera. That idea was the main driver behind this, not necessarily the idea that you're going to take a, you know, 17 kilowatt hour battery out and carry it up a four story walk up. <laughs> like, I don't think that's necessarily the biggest draw for it. I think the draw right now is sustainability. I think eventually that idea is definitely going to have to uh, evolve into the idea of you being able to take those out and maybe charge them in your house. Mm -hmm. But exactly how that comes out in the end remains to be seen. Partitions, this, that, and the other thing. There's tons of opportunities there but we'll just have to wait and see again. Come back in a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I noticed one of the, I can't remember which manufacturers, there was one of the scooter manufacturers, I think European, uh, maybe a Spanish organization that they, 
they actually have like little trailers that you can carry in and yes, we'll fold up into the bike and plug in. Great concept, but um, yeah, like like you say, if you're at the um, the top of a block of flats and uh, or a huge apartment and you've got no lift, then that's going to be quite a challenge to get it up there. Granted, I mean, you have to kind of commend a lot of people trying to solve this problem because it is a mm. it is a big issue, and it's I mean, a massive issue. Yeah, it's, it's you know people who live downtown in apartment buildings. They don't have access to chargers on the street where they park on the street or anything like that. You know that, that mm-hmm. it is a huge issue, but yeah, I don't want to necessarily say that we've we've solved it. You know, I think <laughs> we need to work on solving it. I think by by at least making the battery itself removable, maybe not convenient for that purpose, but for other ones, is the first step in that direction. Sure. Yeah, and I think sort of one of the issues that we've got in the UK here. I don't know if it's the same in. Uh, on your side of the pond is that uh, many of the uh, the street chargers certainly um, they get up completely for cars. So there's no uh, there's no sort of plug in standard household socket if you like. So um, yeah, a lot of bike riders are actually electric bike riders are struggling with that, particularly out on the road. Well, there's no incentives necessarily for landlords to add electrical you know charging for at all. Really, I mean, there's just there's no. There's no reason to uh, in, a, in apartments, at least from their perspective, it's not incentivized. Sure. Uh, so th- that's that's like a that's a huge issue, and that can mainly only be solved with codes and updated building regulations and all kinds of other stuff. So yeah. that's a long way off for sure. <laughs> that's that's a different challenge. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah huge, so huge challenge. Um, the battery range claims. I mean, you're, you're stating sort of around about 300 miles, so that that's 20 percent more than Energy Cause Eco range. So that's that's quite a bold claim. It is. Um, you know, I, I will say I'll try and sum this up to an analogy because mainly at this point we also have. I, I want to assure people we have some tricks up our sleeve. We're not just showing up to Mount Everest trying to climb it in cargo shorts or anything like that. We we've been researching this for a while now, but what I will say is that. You know, in internal combustion at a certain point, they stopped making gas tanks bigger and they started making engines more efficient. Mm -hmm. So I think, and what we're really focusing on, the battery is great. There's nothing wrong with that, but we're really focusing on some of the other components around it to potentially get more out of a battery that exists. So the size of the battery, and you know, to to even back that up a little bit further, we have a lot of real estate yet to even add more or remove or do whatever we really would want, um, mm-hmm. even in our product design right now. So we have some flexibility on that. One way or the other, we are going to get there. That is for sure. I like the gas tank analogy. That's a really good analogy. And yeah. and, and again, yeah. this, this technology, uh, battery technology in particular, is um, is progressing almost on a monthly basis. Um, and, and price range as well is coming down. So, um, yeah. I mean, I, I will also say, too, you know, it brings it back to what you were saying earlier is the idea that, you know, I get the distinct impression with all of the new stuff that's coming out as far as range is concerned, that really by the time this thing hits the road in 2023, um, and even right around that time, 300 miles isn't going to seem as crazy by any stretch of the measure as it does potentially right now. Sure. You know, so, so we're you're... looking we're looking ahead towards that, essentially, you know. Cool. That sounds good. There you go. <laughs> yeah. You got a freight train going past there. Somebody's doing some jackhammering, I think. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. So um, potentially then your um your claims you, you could actually exceed your your claims maybe with the battery. Again, I'm not trying to perjure myself. Um but <laughs> I, I will say that it is I mean, you never you never really know. I, you know, we we are aware of the technology that we want to use and we mm. um are very confident that we're going to be able to get there. There could be some new stuff that comes out next year and all of a sudden it blows everybody's minds. Um, we, we still have the flexibility to be able to potentially adapt something that were to come out, you know, early to mid next year and bring it into production potentially. So it could, uh, it very well may, but I'm not going to say it will. <laughs> you know. Sure. Yeah. I mean, and that's a good position to be in as well, I guess, is that, um, you're developing this this tech and you're you're developing the um, the structures, um, and and what it's, it's fantastic to see startups doing this, and you know the big boys out there being left behind. I mean, there's some of the uh, the major bike manufacturers have not even considered looking at the market yet, and these small startups are coming coming in and uh, you know changing the change of the landscape. I mean, it pretty much is a, a wild west out there in terms of. Uh, 
um, bike, uh, electric bikes um, structure. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of getting back to the, the spirit of biking, uh, just to have that, that freedom and choice and uh, innovation, I guess. It writes, yeah, and I mean, you know, diving in a little bit deeper on that right to repair is like a huge part of our ethos here too. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, um, the the model of uh, essentially planned obsolescence might be challenged by something like this, you know, sure. and in its traditional form of like, we don't make bikes that last very long at all, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's I think there's a lot of opportunity there to maybe challenge the status quo slightly. Um, and we have to we have to see what comes out the other side, obviously. But I, I, I'm very excited about this potentiality for sure. Sounds good. Yeah. And in terms of costs, you've stated that you want it to be um, to be affordable. Um, what do you just see as a, an affordable price point? You know, and that's that's actually been an interesting uh, point that's been brought up again and again. I think, you know, something to keep in mind is that when we look at you know, when we compare it to combustion bikes, sure, twenty five thousand mm-hmm. dollars is, is expensive. But when we yep. compare it to just electric bikes, that's kind of cheap, technically. I mean, you know, it's on the it's on the lower end of the the spectrum because you don't you don't really get to count some of the electric mopeds that are less than ten grand in this mm-hmm. category. I mean, we're yeah. talking about much more power, much higher top speed larger longer range the whole thing so when you're looking at stuff that actually functions like an actual internal combustion bike but in ev world uh you know that's pretty cheap like zero is cheaper uh by a little bit but some of their models aren't so we're kind of trying to trying to be right in that range because what they're doing is frankly amazing we owe them a huge debt of uh of you know for blazing the trail and i think one of their cheapest bikes is 18 and that's after years and years and years of research. That's after years of development, et cetera, et cetera, like tons of time. But as tech continues to get cheap, we definitely believe, especially because we're using hub motors and some of this other tech, that we're going to be able to come in right around that price point for sure. Sure. And I'm very much a firm believer in the the, the fact that, um, you know, find somebody out there that does something good and copy it and do it better. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you know, we don't, we, I, I like zeros. I mean, they were the one, you know, they were the probably the one in the early days when we were looking and window shopping that I was like, mm-hmm. "Ooh, yeah, I could, I, I could get close to this," but then it was, it was, you know, the fully loaded zero is pretty expensive. I was like, "Well, I don't really like this particular style. I'm not seeing anything that resonates with me on the market." But you know, zero for sure, huge debt of gratitude, big yeah. props to them for sure. But yeah, I mean, I think as we go along as this progresses, as the demand picks up, which it is right now. Mm. Um, it's going to be a really exciting space to be in, and we're going to see parts, components, and just prices of these vehicles come down significantly. You know, because I think sure. the live wire was what like thirty eight thousand last the last one they made or something it's, like that. Yeah, yes, yeah, looking around that point, and um, yeah, and but I, I know riders over here in the UK who will who pay that for um, you know an ice bike. Um, Yep, and that's pounds as well. <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, there's, there's something to be said about potentially leasing a thing, um, or not leasing, but, you know, financing a thing or leasing a thing. Because I think, again, you know, these bikes hold will, will ideally hold their value very well because they're built with modular components. So if you walk down that train of thought, like, it will, it will last a lot longer than a lot of other bikes. So it's a decent, you know, I think, investment <laughs> as sure. far as your writing future. <laughs> <laughs> Most definitely. Um, now, the predicted 120 mile an hour is on par with a zero, as you mentioned earlier, the SRS, um, mm-hmm. and it tops the live wires 95 mile an hour. How will your 0 to 60 figures look? Uh, at this point, uh, you know, we threw out 3.6 seconds as a mm-hmm. as a kind of standard. This is That's this just is a, really, that was a challenge, was it? <laughs> it was, it's going to be. It's uh, I mean, a- everything we're doing is going to be a challenge. Again, we don't want to sound arrogant or naive. It is going to be a challenge. But there is also some aspects of being able to make sure that we can't we can't go too far underneath that, or else it's completely unsafe. We mm-hmm. don't want to be too far over that, or else it's just not what we want. We want fast bikes. Um, sure, sure. But the, the key is, is we're going to have to fine tune that with testing. And that comes after we've raised the money for the production intended prototype. And it's, it's the same sort of thing with torque figures and all of these other things. I wish I could give you exact specs. Um, we have ideas of where they are. But again, I don't really, you know, throwing it out there and then it being wrong or different just 
opens yourself up to some liabilities. <laughs> sure, no, of course. And uh, to, yeah, and I guess it's, um, yeah, to set, set that challenge, set the bar, and uh, yeah, try and uh, try and actually beat that bar. I will say, you know, when in the early days when I came to the engineering team and assembled an engineering team and said, 300 mile range, 120 mile top speed, you know, I was laying out these figures of like, this is what we need right now. Mm-hmm. They were like, no, fuck, no, no way. <laughs> like, what are you, you're crazy? You're, you're, you're crazy. And then essentially over the course of a year and a half, research, development, talking, you know, all, all of this stuff. Yep increasingly we were like, Oh no, we, we can do this. You oh can do wow. It, yeah. We could do this. This is, this is absolutely possible. We just need money. <laughs> so, and um, tell us about the money, the, uh, the, the funding campaign, uh, you've gone for WeFunder, is that right? Correct. Uh, WeFunder is an equity crowdfunding platform. So when you invest, you essentially get equity in the company, um, which is really nice for people to have some level of ownership and, or be a part of something like this in that way. It's going pretty well. A uh, week and a half, almost I, almost two weeks now. Um, we're at twenty thousand. So mm-hmm. obviously, there's a way to go. But we're mm-hmm. just now starting to get more and more buzz. And uh, you know, I think now is the time. We've gotten a lot of reviews where people are sort of fifty fifty divided on the spectrum of <laughs> is this real? Can this be real? And the traditional hazing in any industry, which I think is super important to make sure that it keeps the fraudsters out, is happening. And uh, I'm more than willing to answer any questions on this for sure. You know, uh, so this is this is this is the process, and uh, I think we're doing quite well. Um, a lot of small contributions, which is really nice to see as well. You know, mm-hmm. nothing, not not a lot of like ten thousand dollar, you know, big big money coming in, but it's it's all a lot of small contributions from from independent people who just want to see this thing made. No, sure. That, I mean, that's sort of, again, part of the uh, the biking ethos is that, I guess, is that it's that community. Um, so, yeah, put in what you can afford. And um, it needn't necessarily be be big book bucks, like you say, but it's just those small amounts and everyone coming together can make it happen. Oh, I will say the big bucks wouldn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm never, I'm never going to shy away from it in that regard, but yeah, it is, it's heartwarming to see a community come together uh, and to see as many people who have gotten on there and, and uh, you know, bought in, so to speak, uh, to, to have that level of community buy-in is really nice and validating and, you know, encouraging really. Yeah. It makes you feel good about a product that you've got and, uh, and the project as well. Absolutely. Um, so now other than obviously your own bike, um, What's your favorite ever motorcycle? My favorite ever one. Um, that's a very good question. Um, some of those old Beamers I've always loved, but I've never ridden them. You know, mm-hmm. some of those old, I've always pined after them, but I've never gotten my hands, my grubby little hands on one of them yet. The old sort of boxer uh, type ones that. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the the really beautiful, what were they called? The K something, or I think they were the K. There's, the there's the K's and the R's, the R80s, and uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just, there, was a, there was a neighbor of mine when I used to live in Fort Collins that had one that was, uh, you know, it had the beautiful silver tank. Mm-hmm. Uh, design it was it was just so nice he had he, he actually had all of the gear he would ever need to to ride it he was this cool old man. bmw you have to <laughs> oh my god yeah you gotta, that's, we're talking about community buy-in right there my guy like whoa, uh, <laughs> like big time uh but no you know one of those i've always pined after but i personally have an affinity with like the honda cbs i just know how to work on them i have one in the shed right now that we're about to tear apart um and so that, and actually weirdly like old uh, vintage mopeds I've, I've right got a for those as well, like old French ones and stuff. So I've got a mm-hmm. couple of those walking around. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, so, that's, I, I guess it's like my favorite one aesthetically, yes, Beamers, but really like the one that I like the most to ride is probably like a CB. CBs. Okay. Uh, yeah. The, one of my favorites is the uh, 754. So uh, yeah, yeah, love them. I have, a, I have a friend that has one of those actually. Our marketing director has one. Um, I think he has a, yeah, it's a seven. Yeah. It's a 754. Uh, mm-hmm. I think. And uh, he's, he's currently working on the front suspension, I think today or tomorrow, cause it's got a bad leak. So, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, he's, yeah, he's, I've got one of those yeah. as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he came out, his brakes were all squishy. He was like, what's going on? What's oh, going no. On? Oh, no. <laughs> Pool of oil. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, man. Um, yeah, yeah. So you get, um, picture this, you, you've got your crowdfunding, production's mm-hmm. full swing. Um, you're riding off into the sunset on your first ever 
production electro cycle um mm-hmm. what would your track of choice be to play on your helmet integrated sound system my track of choice oh man um there's a couple locally that are pretty good i mean give me an old airfield and i'll be happy to be honest uh there's there's a couple of uh, okay i'm going to i'm going to come clean i don't really think i'm that much of a track guy i'm a mm-hmm. we're in the mountains here so i'm a kind of the let's go up onto some mountain roads you're, and you're i can onto the you, twisties oh i can name you all of the mountain roads that are perfect up in here actually there's this great stretch of road that anybody should should do i mean up to estes park is beautiful um, but there's this reservoir up in Fort Collins. It's this giant, beautiful lake. Um, and there's a beautiful road that just kind of wanders around it. And there's these huge, dramatic cliffs, beautiful mountain vistas you can see for miles and miles and miles. It's like that's Sounds ideal. I yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> immediately where I would go. I mean, like a track is great for testing. We can do it in an airfield. We'll do that. Um, I, but for me, it's the, yeah, it's the mountains, the scenery, you know, it's being out in nature, that kind of thing that really you know, gets me excited about it. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like that. No, I was thinking more in terms of uh, music tracks, what your playlist would be. Oh, oh so dear disappearing God. into the I, sunset with your oh favorite music track. I'm sorry. I, totally well, I like that as well. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you meant like actual race trackers. I was like, no, no, I'll take that. I'll take the mountain highway. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So music <laughs> track, that is a really good question. I'm, I am a musician myself and spent a lot of time in the arts. Cool. Um, I mean, to be honest, you know, Edgar Wright has that new movie coming out, Sparks, about mm-hmm. the band Sparks. Yeah, yeah. And I've been re-listening to some of their early, I've been trying to go through and listen to their whole discography. And I think it's the second album. I heard a song the other day that I was like, ooh, yeah. I mean, really, anything off the first album is, is brilliant. Genius, yeah, um, yeah. But I think it's... Is it their second album? Hold on, I'll pull it up right now because I've got my phone. <laughs> yes, the, uh, the Propaganda album. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's it's one of these songs. It's something like, it, you know, but maybe something by them. It'd be current, I suppose. <laughs> you know? Sparks on the electro cycle. I like that. And that sounds like a really good point to end on. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank fantastic you so that, that is just yeah I'm, i mean what an exit we couldn't have planned that better <laughs> <laughs> i suppose yeah that, that's i'm glad we cleared that up that would have been funny you know but yeah thank you <laughs> thank you again for having me i really appreciate it